Hello, I am Vishnu Priya and my story is called Window to the Willow. There once lived a girl who had lost her emotions. Her life had always been rather ordinary, but at some point of time she realized she could no longer laugh. She read jokes, forced her friends to tickle her, but she felt nothing more than a faint smile curling her lips. It's just a laugh. Maybe things aren't so funny anymore, she convinced herself. It was just a laugh. It would return one day. But as days trudged on and the summer sky blazed, the girl came to another terrifying realization. She had spent a whole summer day playing, but not once had she smiled. She had looked at flowers, the faces of little babies peeking from behind their parents' shoulders, and had gone to the bakery and bought herself a piece of cake. But her face remained stoic. She felt no smile. The girl was a little confused. Maybe I don't feel so happy today, she told herself. I'll be fine tomorrow. Days trudged on, and the tomorrow the girl was looking for never came. Instead, all she felt was a little less colourful and a little less whole every day. She no longer got angry when she was yelled at, neither did she cry when she tripped. Instead, all she felt was just a bubble of emptiness underneath her skin enveloping her body. She felt like a cloudy day waiting for the absent rain clouds, longing for a drizzle, a strong wind or just some thunder or lightning but the clouds bore no promises of change. The girl had heard about these feelings before. Your father's family is cursed, her mother had told her once. He went looking for something and never came back. It must have been the same thing she was searching for. Following her father's footsteps, she set out on a journey of finding her lost emotions. She travelled far and wide. She spent her days roaming from one place to another, asking passerbys on the road for their help which they politely refused with judging eyes. Soon she became a legend, the girl with no emotions. Her fame spread far and wide. Holds of people would gather to see her walk by. The girl with no emotions has come, one would announce to the whole town. Don't answer her questions. She steals people's emotions, another would warn. But ironically, she was treated as a sign of good luck too. The girl with no emotions only comes to happy and prosperous towns. Being both welcomed and shunned, the girl had nowhere to go, nowhere to stay, and no one to ask for help. Her quest to recover her lost emotions now seemed a distant dream, the longing of which she would have to live with the rest of her life. She neither felt hate, anger, nor sadness at the people's reactions around her. Hate, anger, and sadness, they were now just words in her head with a faint lingering memory of how she used to be able to feel them. It was in one particularly isolated town surrounded by the forest that a small little boy walked up to her and said, There is a woman in the forest. She cured my mother when she lost her emotions. She lives in the willow tree. Come, I'll take you with me. The girl followed the boy unquestioningly. They walked for what seemed like hours until finally a bent-down willow tree appeared in the middle of the forest. Here, said the boy, stopping in front of the willow tree. The girl with no emotion stared back at the tree blankly. It seemed like any other ordinary tree. The boy knocked three times on the trunk and said, Miss Willow, the girl here lost her emotions. She needs your help. The branches of the willow tree swayed furiously, and from the middle of the trunk of the bent-down willow appeared the face of a woman carved on it. The woman's eyes were closed, but she had a smile on her face. Come, the leaves of the willow tree whispered. The boy pushed the girl closer to the willow tree. The girl with no emotions felt no fear. She stood right in front of Miss Willow. How did you lose your emotions? Miss Willow's leaves whispered. I don't know. They disappeared one by one, the girl responded. Come, Miss Willow whispered once more. The trunk of the willow tree split in half, creating an opening big enough for the girl to pass through. Go inside, the little boy said. My mother got her emotions back after she went in. The girl stepped into the willow tree and was engulfed in darkness. The opening closed behind her, getting rid of any light. Nothing happened. The girl with no emotions waited and waited, but nothing happened. It was dark and quiet. She could hear nothing but the sound of her own heartbeat. Left alone with her thoughts, she reminisced of the time she had had emotions, of how they had felt. But those memories were faint. She seemed to be forgetting them, like trying to recollect the details of a beautiful dream the next morning. Now, 
All she could see and feel was the darkness and emptiness surrounding her. Drowned in seeming nothingness, the girl with no emotions felt her longing to feel being stripped away from her into the abyss. There she was, inside of a willow tree, unsure of whether this was all just another dream like the emotion she once had. It's all right, she told herself. Dreams pass. There are much more beautiful dreams waiting to be dreamt. And for the oddest of reasons, she found the thought of it rather comforting. Suddenly, she felt a faint warmth growing within her. And soon enough, the girl with no emotions found herself outside the willow tree. The afternoon summer sun was blazing high with a new enthusiasm that the girl, who had once been numbed and still was, could now at least appreciate its warmth. Looking for a home. Isn't she lovely? Isn't she wonderful? Isn't she precious? Stevie Wonder's song plays. Another Stephen is looking for something to buy. Something else desperately needs a home. It's so crowded here and we're held in too tightly. How can I get noticed? How can anyone see, let alone pick me? Hello, what about me? Look here. I'm bright and beautiful. I'm a star. Reach out for me. Isn't she lovely? Made from love. Life and love are the same. Yes, Stevie, take it away. There's another man looking. What is he doing? He's wrong. No, no, not her. Put her down. What about me? Get a grip. Yes, that's it. Pick me up. Look me over. No, you're tickling. <laughs> oh, no. Now he's putting me back. What an idiot. I'm yours for the taking. He's coming back. If I send out positive vibes, he'll appreciate my charms. Yes, he's looking my way again. Pick me up. Stroking me. Yes, you're getting it. Now he's talking to the nice lady. Getting out his wallet. We've got a result. Payment is made. I'm ready and we're off. Yippee! This is so exciting. I can't believe what God has done. This is my song. I think I'm about to meet my life's purpose. But what will my new home be like? Am I ready? Who is he? Can he be trusted? He's white. Is that good or bad? Calm down. Let's see what happens. He's showing me to someone else with a big white beard and belly wearing red. This is weird. Are they together? That's not my idea of bliss. I'm not judging others. It's each to their own, but if I'm moving into their place, I need to know the setup. I'm modern. I know that gay marriages, people living together are in, but I need to adjust. It's not what I'd expected. I wanted something more conventional. I ooze tradition. Don't prejudge. Let's give him a chance. I think we're now at his home. Could we make this work, even though it's not what I expected when I came into this world? I see a woman. Now, as Stevie, <laughs> Stevie Wonder says, I'm lovely, but hey, this woman is absolutely beautiful. A dark, smooth complexion. Unlike the pasty white guy, I realise that Father Christmas was just a friend. Phew. Isn't she lovely? Isn't she wonderful? Isn't she precious? Stevie continues. The man and woman are together. It's happening. He doesn't hang around. None of this waiting for the best time. He's straight to it. Mangela, he says. Will you? And then I can't quite catch the rest. 
blah, blah, blah. Get on with it, man. Blah, blah. Wow, what a smile. I've got a full view of her now. She really is radiating. I'm loving her. What did she say? She's looking down. No. Yes. Wonderful. That's made my day my life she's beaming at me and lit up the room it's love all around i found a home yes she takes me out of the box strokes me she's radiant i'm really loving this and her i'm going to be so happy he slips me on her finger if i was a cow i'd jump over the moon I have my own family. I've been her engagement ring now for over two years. It's no accident that I'm gold and the shape of a star. I've traveled to England where he's from, been shown to everyone and settled into a routine. I'm only on her finger on special occasions. At other times, I'm placed back in the box or wrapped in a tissue and tucked away in a warm place in her bra, under her mattress, or in the folds of her saris. Since that very first day, it's been an absolute joy. This is a happy house, with people constantly coming and going, and I've even got used to the big black dog. The crowning glory was their wedding, celebrating our love, with my beamingly beautiful Mangela, we were stars together. It's a year since they married. Everything is out of sorts with Mangela's husband, Stephen. They left the house yesterday in the Ambassador. I don't feel good about this. I'm unhappy and home alone. Stephen has returned without Mangela. There's something about him. He's sad and his eyes are wet. I'm under the mattress. Hey, I'm here, be careful. Stop whatever you're doing, whoa. I'm flying through the air, then roll along the floor. He takes the mattress and then the bed outside. What is going on? Hey, you, Stephen, you clots, I'm here in the dark in the corner under something come and pick me up please i give up it's been hours or maybe days i've no way of telling how will he ever find me hang on someone is coming it's not him it's a woman not my mangela hey here look this way she's scanning finds me picks me up I'm up, up and away, and puts me in a warm place. Whatever next. Postscript. My friend Brian from the UK and I bought Mangela's engagement ring at a jeweler's in Mysore. On that very day, I asked Mangela to marry me, and she said yes. That was five years ago. We'd been together in one way and another for nine years. On the day she died, as part of the Hindu rituals, she was brought home and laid on her bed outside our house for people to visit, show their love and do puja. I have no idea if rings can appreciate what's happening. The ring is now lost. I don't know what happened to it. Maybe it was tucked away under the mattress and lost when I lifted the mattress and someone else found it. Maybe it was taken in the chaos of that day when people were in and out of our house. I just don't know. It's not important. Hi, my name is Vishal Sharma. Today's story is The Wind Beneath My Wings. Dhanwali Cycle Mart.
an ordinary small town rental shop for bicycles but to me and many like me it rented an hour of bliss every day 50 paisa for an hour of bicycle riding was a very steep price and coupled with late fees it could surmount to a huge financial setback i was unemployed pocket money dependent 8 year old youth who couldn't take the challenges of asking for surplus funding from my parents mr dhanwani was a cold hearted businessman when it came to late fees he charged us in 30 minute slots that means a 5 minute delay would cost another 25 paisa that was atrocious but in lieu of any competition he could swindle money with impunity there were no consumer codes for bicycle renting in pimpri my hometown and dhanwani used this advantage well enough although 25 paisa in the 1980s was a good enough reason for a child to kill a grown up man with his bare paws but i managed to keep my calm another reason being the next day he was the only one who could offer me one hour of seventh heaven and it wouldn't help me to kill him the bicycles at dhanwani's were some strange local brand without any logo or name just painted frames bolted on two wheels and a handle he purposely painted them in flashy and tawdry colors to deter any mastermind child from planning a heist who could steal a bright yellow colored bicycle with no name and no logo he had a special sun bleach tandem bicycle it's a funny thing a twin bicycle what if the riders had a difference of opinion on where to go how would they decide a tug of war of pedaling perhaps could that solve the dispute cycling was a pretty graphic skill to learn a lot of yelling blood tears were involved my first bicycle was a green unnamed single rider bicycle dhanwani had a very sophisticated measure of sizing for each child we had to prop ourselves on the seat extend our feet down if the tip of our toes barely brushed the ground we were married to the bicycle for one hour no negotiations were allowed danwani's verdict was final no freedom of choice i got married to the green one although i was quoting the red dad paid him the hefty sum and steer the cycle by hand until it came to me i am scared of what of falling down i have never ridden a one before let me tell you this you will fall you will hurt yourself you might feel crappy about it but does that mean you won't ride a bicycle your whole life grown ups had a weird way of encouraging i thought was that pep talk meant to make me jump on the seat and pedal away in confidence onto the open roads i was hoping for a less violent scenario but nevertheless excitement overweighed fear with all the confidence in the world i swung my leg across the seat and was very soon sitting on the bike with my legs just kissing the ground gathering whatever support i could from mother earth pedal son pedal you need to pedal to move forward no i will fall no you will not see i have held the seat on the back side i have a firm grip on it just raise your feet to the pedal please don't let me go i am scared of the fall the words could barely leave my lips as i pedal forward dad was pulling 45 years of his age just to keep me afloat on my cycle the faster i got the heavier his breath he never let go of the back seat giving me an illusion of balancing skills on my part it was an explosion of emotions having both feet on the pedal and still moving forward for one brief moment i thought i could fly an occasional stop an occasional turn an occasional word of encouragement and an occasional swell of pride all of it accounted for a joyous occasion my first bicycle ride i made a steep turn towards school road just to take a victory lap before we could bring back the beast to its cave a sudden jerk on the handle 
eyes wide shut, eyebrows spreading apart, a loud shriek, a crash, a boom and a bang. The fall was as deafening as it was confusing. All I could see was dad running from what I judged was around four houses away from the crash site. In small towns, distances are not measured in kilometers. They are measured in houses, in streets, in shops. Are you okay? You let me go. You said you would never let go. I was howling. I could feel pain in my knees and elbows were all scratched up and quickly changing to color red. Above all, I could feel the pain in my heart. Why did he let go? He promised he would never let go. You have to fall, son. You have to fall. You can never rise without falling and you can never learn without making mistakes. Tell me why you fell. I was too fast to turn and I lost my balance. See, you know something now, something you never knew. Next time, slow down when you turn. I did not let you go, son. I just let you explore and learn. It has its own charm. Someday, you will know. I am 45 now. I did not understand those big words back then as I do now. You let me explore the freedom of my first ride. You let me explore my education. You let me explore my choices, my first car, my first job. You even let me explore my mistakes. You never judged. Every new foray in life, every new possibility. You gave me your signature motivational speech. You held back that seat for a little while and you let me explore life. You ran with me without considering the age of your knees. You missed meals. You missed sleep. You worked hard and you kept me afloat. You never held me back, never pulled me down. You let me soar, soar high in the sky. Dad, you are and will be the wind beneath my wings. Thank you. Hi, this is Shantini here and I'm here to present my piece named Maya. It was an early November morning in Bhara, a small village in West Bengal. The pungent charcoal smell dominated the air. It was part of Bibhu's routine to open the main gates of the Kalibari in the early morning hours and clean the front yard. Khapama, the family deity as she is referred to in the Chatterjee Bari, has been in the family for over 100 years. Bibhu had been performing this ritual for over 10 years with perfection. The Chatterjees were one of the most influential households in the village. If the stories are to be believed, it was Khepama who used to instruct Kortama, the head of the family and Shuki's grandmother, in her dreams about the business proposals and opportunities which helped the family's fortune. The villagers believed that Khepama resided in the Chatterjee Bari. When Bibhu was offered the job in Chatterjee Bari, he was delighted. Bibhu, a Shautal tribal whose mother, Pebashi Mashi, as she was known, was Kortama's personal maid. From wrapping beetle leaf and arachnid to serving her tender coconut water each day at 3 pm without fail to helping her drape an expensive off white silk sari in the evenings, followed by fetching her freshly brewed Darjeeling tea while she tuned into her favorite radio station. It was on her request that Kortama decided to appoint Bibhu. There were many Shautals employed by the house. Few worked in their fields, few in the house, and a few in the ration shop. Since there were enough people employed already, Kortama decided to hand over the duty of cleaning Kalibari to Bibhu, which was otherwise exclusively done by Kortama. Every morning, Bibhu would start the day humming the Shautal folklore song. Shuki, the third daughter of the Chatterjee Bari and Kortama's favorite, would wake up to these songs and grab a seat on the stairs in the Bari overlooking the temple. She would thoroughly enjoy the melody and also cheekily interrupt Bibhu to tell him if he missed a spot while cleaning. He would angrily shout back, Shuki, what joy do you get interrupting me? Let me have my time with Khepama and please get back to your studies. I was just trying to help here, you see. You have left a good piece of dirt over there. 
Shruti pointed at the fallen leaves near the steps of the temple. I have seen it already and will clean it. Bibu shot back trying to hide his embarrassment. This was how usual mornings at the Chatterjee Bari usually were until one day when everyone woke to the sound of wailing Bibu. It must have been around 4:30 in the morning. Bibu, what happened? Calm down. Shruti's father exclaimed while rushing down the stairs. Meanwhile, the household had gathered around Bibu seemingly worried. Ki hoyeche? Kortama demanded while walking out of her room with the help of a walking stick and wearing her thick eyeglasses. Ma, there is a limit to humiliation. Every day Shruti used to interrupt me while cleaning, but today what she did I can never forgive. So what if I am a house help? I cannot tolerate this behavior and enraged Bibu shouted at the top of his voice. Bibu, there must be some misunderstanding. First you need to tell us what happened here. As far as you are concerned, I think the past 10 years were enough for you to judge the kids of the house. They would never insult any one of you. You are all family. A composed Kortama replied. Teary eyed Bibu started. This morning when I came here I could not find the broom at its place so I went over to the other side of the temple and fetched the other broom I started my work and Shuki came over and sat near the temple stairs today all family members and Shuki's sisters especially stared at each other with wide eyes Bibu paused wiped his tears and continued I started humming the song as usual but she suddenly rushed towards me as if i had committed some mistake and she gave me a tight slap see babu you can still see the fingerprints bibu turned towards suki shuki's father and pointed his cheek everybody froze in disbelief they could see the fingerprints nonsense my daughter would never do this are you out of your mind shuki's father explained kartama interrupted bibu you claim shuki slapped you If that is the case where is she did she run back to the house no kortama she definitely did not run back to the house she must be here somewhere he frantically started searching for shuki as he was sure she did not head back home where is shuki kortama demanded korta shuki is still fast asleep yesterday the lantern in her room ran out of oil that is why she headed to my room and was up till late night she was preparing for her entrance exam i remember Also I vaguely remember that she went to bed around 3 a.m. It cannot be her Kortama. Jaya, Shuki's elder sister replied, seemingly worried. Nonsense, it was her. Call her, I will confront her. Bibu commanded. Shuki, wake up, ma, quick. Shuki's mom frantically woke Shuki. What? What happened, ma? Ki hoyeche? Is everything okay? Shuki woke up rubbing her eyes. Shuki's mom grabbed her arm and both rushed towards the Kalibadi. Everyone was shocked to see her. She was still in her nightdress and as far as everybody in the house knew, she would never step out of her room in a nightdress. But Bibu was blinded by anger. He shot at her. "Shuki, tell them you slapped me. You know what you did. This is humiliating." Shuki's mouth fell wide open. "What? Did you booze today here before coming in the morning, Bibu da? Matha kharap hoye gache?" she sprung she sprung forward as if she wanted to get into a fight when and why should i slap you why are you dragging me into this mess i was not even here a red faced shuki claimed that's true bibuda shuki da was with, shuki was with me all this time in my room she was deep asleep jaya responded then who was it what just happened here bibu started thinking Wait a minute. Why are you using that broom? Don't you know you're not supposed to use that for cleaning the mandir? That is the broom we we usually use to clean the stray litter. Shuki tried to explain by pointing her finger at the broom. What? Kortama exclaimed and looked at Bibu. They both exchanged glances. All of you, enough for the day. Get back to your work. Shuki, go get some rest, Shona. Kortama demanded. After everyone left, Kortama walked towards Bibu. 
it was her bibhu i had warned you time and again to be extremely cautious with this work it was khepama who slapped you and not shuki kortama patted bibhu's shoulder bibhu stood bewildered not able to believe what happened that morning bibhu was not to be seen after that incident many days later the chatterjee family found out that he had taken up shakti geeti and traveled across villages singing the glories of almighty kali goddess based on a true story thank you fraternity bridge looked like every other high end apartment complex in the heart of bangalore There were four blocks with two wings each. So from the sky, what one saw was a square of luxury. People yearned for a few square feet of area here, but not Evelyn Souza. She didn't know the value of the apartment she would possess there. She was ignorant of the competition that waited to grab at even the hint of an available any apartment. Not even tenants were not allowed in this space. It was a strictly owners only. A morning call from Evelyn's mother in Mumbai made Evelyn realize that her late grandfather had left her an apartment in the Fraternity Bridge. Though Mr. Souza passed away few years back, the will had a provision that stated when Evelyn would turn 23, she would be in possession of her own apartment. It took her less than five minutes after the call to make up her mind to move to Bangalore from Goa. As she approached the city, she could see the four tall buildings from a distance of about a kilometer while sitting in her cab. The A in AB fifteen zero two stood for the block name Archnomi. Though the block name struck as weird name, it gave her a sense of strength, something that she hasn't felt for a really long time now. A moment after she crossed the main gate, she was handed over a pamphlet and a welcome box. As she stopped in the first. front of this first square building she saw a lady holding up a sign with her name on it evelyn waved at the lady seeing her wave the lady who looked more like a junior clerk than support staff approached her good morning ma'am you are at the autonomy here your grandfather was a legendary man he used to throw legendary parties at his time i will help you become a legendary like him if you wish to said the weirdly polished lady sure may i know your name and What exactly is your role here? asked Evelyn, confused. I'm Sel. I'm your right hand here. Everything you need, you will find in me. I'm a robot with an AI smarter than most of the AIs in this world. Oh, I sense that you're confused. You know nothing about Fraternity Bridge, the position you hold here, the job you have or not have. That would be your wish again, said the lady. Anyways, I'll do my job and tell you everything you need to know. Evelyn didn't understand anything, but nodded. She accompanied Sel in the lobby of A Block. As they entered A B fifteen zero two, Evelyn noticed that the nameplate on the front door of a flat has already been changed to her name. The moment she entered, she noticed that the entire apartment was filled with her favorite things. The kitchen held the snacks she loved from all around the world. Her bedroom had a favorite set of prints. The hall had plants that she loved. Everything looked perfect and frightening. What's this? Evelyn told to Sel. Sel asked Evelyn to be seated. A one fifty-five inch TV was fitted on the wall. Sel turned it on. As the video started, Sel started sinking her voice to it. Evelyn pinched herself to check if she was dreaming. Sel started with a duty. Welcome to Federated Bridge Evelyn Souza. You are a part of Autonomy where you will be a legend regardless of the choices you make. The Federated Bridge was constructed about 100 years back to bring together the modern technology with bygone divisions of morality. Believe the genetics of morality doesn't change so being a part of Federated Bridge is both a luck and a job. Your job is to make daily choices and exist. The accumulation of an autonomous choice is replicated by thousands of robots living among the humans, which would statistically mean you exist in one tenth of the population of the world. Autonomy is the A block. You represent moral freedom. The B block stands for bureaucracy. The C for the cunning, and D for dilemma. All the four blocks together balance the morality of the world. The autonomy is the ideal and the dominant of the four. 
the bureaucracy serves the three. They are the administration. Cunning is the evil but posed in front of autonomy. And lastly, dilemma is the twin of autonomy and your choices would be their guiding light. The society's amenities and schedule is listed down in the pamphlet. And should you need anything, cell is available for your assistance. Most of the people living here hardly work as their individual needs are taken care of by the association. But should you want to walk? That's your choice as part of autonomy. But you should be glad to know your only job is existing in this world. And to keep making choices. Your tiniest choice affects the world population. Example, if you plant a tree, several others do the same at the same time. The things you think or dream, most of them would happen. If you stay estranged from your mother, thousands of millennials robots will make the same choice and propagate it regardless of the history. Also, also, if you make the choice of not passing down the apartment to any future heir, do tell us about it in a written notice within 10 years from today. We would find a replacement who has a similar gene pool like yours, post to natural death. Only rule you follow throughout your life. Don't talk about Fraternity Bridge for a month when you're away from this place. Your memory will be selective, post that and will be about the luxury you have here. We look forward to the choices you make. Sell board at the end of the orientation, turned off the TV and smiled looking towards Evelyn, waiting for the first choice that Evelyn would make. Thank you. Hello, my name is Pranavi and today I am going to narrate a story titled The Button. It was a cold dank day with the sky the color of a soiled mop. But when Basu heard the knock on the door, he was ready. The bullock cart rocked and splotches of mud covered the wheels as they made their way to the side. Basu clenched his teeth as his left hand hit the side of the cart. Everything hurt except the middle finger. As he ran his left hand over the broken nail on the finger, he remembered how Mylar Gauda had slipped through his hand. It still hadn't grown. If only it would have stuck to his finger for a few seconds that day. As the bullock cart pulled closer to the site, Basu saw him. He lay there in the ice-like block. People surrounded it with chisels and hammers trying their best to break it without hurting Maila Gauda. It had been over a week now since Basu had found him on the bank of Kali River. I think they are going to get through today, Ramesh said as Basu dismounted the cart. The others were scattered around. Neil was standing with his wife. Basu was sure he had been dragged there by her. Satish and the rest made eye contact with him, nodding their heads. Satish pulled at his lungi, bringing it up and tying it in a knot, but within seconds it was down again. Rudramuni had fled the village three days back, leaving behind his wife and son. His wife believed he would return, calling it one of his drunken endeavours, but Basu knew he wouldn't, not with the chief inspector of Yallapur handling the case. The sound of chisels drew Basu's attention to the block. The villagers were just inches away from setting Maila Gauda free. The skeletal remains of his right hand stuck out of the block. A few fingers had broken off when the block had been lifted. His body lay in pristine condition inside the block, not having aged a single bit since Basu had last seen him. He was still a ten-year-old boy. What the block was made of, no one knew. The villagers had tried to melt it with fire, but it hadn't budged. The only things working were chisels and hammers. Aren't you worried? Ramesh pressed on, breaking Basu's chain of thought. No, I'm not, he lied. What if he's alive? What if he remembers? Basu tried to control the volume of his shaking voice. Then we pay for what we did, Basu replied. He had wanted to pay for what he had done for the past 15 years. What do you mean we? You pushed him, not us. Ramesh said. This time, his voice didn't tremble. But that was the truth. Basu had pushed him in a way. He wondered if the 50 paisa coin in, was in his pocket. All they would have gotten would have been five tamarind candies from it. If not, 
then all he had done that day was for nothing. His eyes clouded and his knees buckled as he remembered. His hand sunk into a puddle. His hand sunk into a puddle as he fell. I know you have the money, Ramesh had shouted that day. And just like that day, the soil over which Basu fell was wet. Their feet had left marks at the, as they had inched towards Mylar Gowda. I don't have it. Devrane, Mylar Gowda had shouted. Basu, check his pockets, Ramesh had ordered. But Mylar Gowda had stepped back. Get him, Rudramuni and Satish had shouted. You liar, Basu said, trying to get close to him. But the thundo- thundering Sathodi Falls had, so- had stopped him. They were on the edge of a cliff. Mylar Gowda, with his back to the falls, continued stepping backwards. As soon as Basu had grabbed him, Mylar Gowda had slipped. Yappa! Basu had shouted as the nail of his middle finger caught on to one of the buttons of Mylar's shirt. With his right hand yanked, he could feel his shoulder come out of the joint. It had been a few seconds, but Basu remembered each one of them. He had tried to hold on to him. He recalled the second Mylar had slipped, taking Basu's nail with him. As Basu regained his balance with the help of Ramesh, he could still see the blood stain on Mylar's shirt and a button missing. Mylar's mother, sitting in front of the block, was offering prayers with the hope that her son would be alive. Basu remembered all the prayers he had offered to Lord Shiva to keep him out of trouble. But the day he had found Mylar, he couldn't let go. Not again. Shiva wouldn't forgive him. He held on to the lingu hanging inside his shirt. It broke, a villager shouted. Within minutes, people had swarmed Mylar's body. And that's when Basu heard Mylar's mother wailing. Pushing against the crowd, Basu saw Mylar's eyes for one last time before they were slowly closed by a police officer. Basu's eyes met Ramesh's. It would remain the best kept secret. Thank you. The Arrival Despite having lived in Bangalore for 23 years, I couldn't speak Kannada very well. I was married to a tall and fair Brahmin boy, born and raised in the city. Shekhar, my husband, had a very small circle of friends, but even with them, I would often feel out of place. As the sunshine beamed through the multicolored curtains, I tied my hair loosely in a bun and walked towards my son's bedroom, pondering over a list of things I needed to complete before his arrival. Tucking the corners of the bedsheet under the mattress, I placed two large pillows on the bed. I began clearing an old stack of newspapers when a thin book slipped and fell on my feet. Curious, I bent down to pick it up and adjusted the spectacles resting on my fleshy nose. It read, Amar Chitra Katha. Karthik never gravitated towards reading mythological stories, I mumbled to myself. Putting on a reminiscent smile, I quickly flipped through the pages of young princes and soldiers fighting bravely on the battlefields. The divine was showcased in all its glory and grandeur. Suddenly, I paused at page 32. The rhythmic beat of my silver anklets seemed to reflect my loneliness as I gradually walked towards the rocking chair to read the book, lost in thought. Karna, the tragic hero of the epic tale Mahabharata, an accomplished warrior of extraordinary abilities, was also an accidental love child rejected at birth. But nature being kind, had ushered him into the lap of a nurturing family. As I read through the story, a familiar but fragile voice spoke from within me. I rocked myself to and fro as my mind's eye journeyed back to the days in Srinagar. 
The icy roads and avalanches made it hard to travel during the winters. I lived with my father, K. L. Raghunath, in a small rented house on top of Jahangir Bakery. It was located in a busy market street. Like other houses in the Mohalla, the bedrooms were small. The walls and flooring were shielded in wood. We barely spoke to each other after he learnt about my pregnancy. I've kept the medicines on the table, Malati, he said and walked out of the room curtly. Moments like these drew a deep sense of gratitude but also overtook a sea of confused emotions. I would break down every day. The concern for my baby was constantly being overshadowed by guilt that pierced straight into my gut. Shame was a permanent tattoo on my face. After 20 long hours of a strenuous delivery, I lay exhausted. At my side was my baby. Overwhelming love and fierce protectiveness gripped me as I heard my father speak over the phone in his strong and deep voice. He cut the call on seeing Geeta auntie in the living room. Geeta auntie was a close family friend who had helped us during our stay there. She stood next to the fireplace wearing a worried look. My father refused to meet her eye, she later told me. In the silence of the evening, I could see their shadows through the curtains. Raghunath, Malati is a very sensitive girl. This will become an irreparable tragedy if you refuse to even see her. After all, she's your only daughter, she said, sounding distressed. Am I not doing my duty as a father? He asked, looking at her enraged. A child born out of wedlock is a sin. If it was anybody else in my place, he would have thrown her out by now. He immediately got up from his seat and lit his pipe. Blowing out the smoke slowly, he began to pace the wooden floor with a feverish haste. The clock struck three. Malati realizes her mistake, Raghu. And this is not just her fault, and you know that too. We need to handle this on a practical level without losing sight of its psychological implications. Right now, she's insecure, guilty, and, and battling a deep emotional turmoil all by herself. Look, I understand her mother's death was sudden and came as a shock to all of us. My father spoke standing in front of her. For a long time, Malti just didn't have the ability to accept and process grief. But that simply cannot justify the illicit relationship she had with our neighbor's boy. What do you expect of me, Geeta? Pat her back? Sing her baby a lullaby? Oh, for God's sake, Raghu. She's only 19. There was an empty void in her that no one could fill after Kamala's demise. Until, of course, Girish came along. She said, lowering her head. See, this is what one moment of weakness can do to you. Did she think of me? Did she think of how it could impact her future? Did she think at all? Geeta, our destiny is shaped by our actions and decisions. He argued, wearing a stoic look on his face. To err is human, Raghunath. You can't be so harsh on her for just one moment of weakness. She deserves a second chance, don't you think? Well, and that's why I have fixed her marriage with my client's son, my father said, gripping the pipe tightly in his hand. She'll be moving to Bangalore soon after the wedding. And as for the baby, it will be sent off to an orphanage. I have explained everything to Jamuna. A heavy silence settled over the living room, thicker than the uneasy tension that had erupted. My decision is final 
and irrevocable, he said, stomping out. I left for Hyderabad two days later, alone with my heavy heart. I removed my tear-stained glasses and kept the book on the side table. My palms were drenched in perspiration. Across me was an old photograph of my son crawling on his fours. For a moment, her tiny fingers and sleepy yawn crept into my mind. I'm sorry, I whispered to myself as my heart tore into pieces. Hi everyone, I'm Apeksha Rao. During my time at Anita's attic, I worked on a book that was a murder mystery set in a palace in the 19th century. I'd like to read you a passage from the first chapter of that book. Padmaja struggled like a wild animal, but the ropes tying her to the bed held tight. Angry tears ran down her face. She glared helplessly at the man looming over her blade in hand. As his wife, she was his to be loved, cherished, beaten, brutalized, or even killed if he so wished. He ran a finger over the blade, checking it for sharpness. I hate to do this, my dear, but you've left me no choice. You must pay for your family's deceit. There was a cackle from behind the jharoka in the wall. Make her pay, make the bitch pay, cried his two wives and 50 concubines in unison. Her big brown eyes entreated him to have mercy on her but he turned away. He poured some frightfully expensive French brandy, part of her dowry, over the blade and held it over the flame of the big brass lamp in the corner. She heard a soft hiss as the brandy caught fire. Her husband turned to her and held out the blade. See, it's nice and clean. I told you not to worry. I'll make it quick. She lay spread eagled on a small bed with her limbs tied to the four posts. A garland of jasmine had come loose from its moorings and was lying across her knee. There were rose petals all over the bed. It was a mockery of a wedding night. Her husband pulled the ghagra away from her right foot and stared at it in disgust. The extra toe that no one had told him about. He raised his blade high in the air and brought it down in one smooth swoop. She screamed as loudly as the gag allowed and shut her eyes tight. Rajkumari sa! Princess, wake up! Padmaja, princess of Rajgar, sat up with a huge gasp and looked blankly at the girl who was wiping her forehead with a damp muslin cloth. Shh! Calm down, princess. You're awake now, Minakshi crooned. It was just a dream. Padmaja fell back against the pillow, sobbing in relief. She wasn't about to lose her sixth toe to, to her brute of a husband. She didn't even have a sixth toe anymore. Five months ago, her mother had had it chopped off in a bid to end her daughter's end run of bad luck. Now, all she had was a scar and an ache where the toe used to be. What was worse, she had a mother who hadn't stopped gloating ever since the heir to the throne of Pratapgarh had offered to marry her daughter. You're going to be a Rani someday. Isn't that better than rotting in your brother's zanana? She had a point, mused Padmaja, as she threw off her covers and coiled her long hair into a knot. It was still dark outside, the best time for a morning ride, she thought, as she dug out an old white salwar and its matching tunic from the bottom of her favourite armoire. Princess, there's no time for a ride today. It's your wedding day. Your mother will have me roasted alive on a slow spit if anyone sees you out there, screeched Minakshi. I have to go for one last ride, Minakshi. I'll be back in an hour, she promised. Padmaja was desperate for one last ride. She had to say goodbye. Only she didn't know if he would be there. He was. As Padmaja walked briskly past the snoring guards, she saw him waiting outside the Zanana gates. Tall and lean, with thick curly hair cut unfashionably short. His cold black eyes were fixed on her. She slowed down and tried to bring her breathing back to normal. Fancy meeting you here, she exclaimed, as if she hadn't planned this encounter. Ratan Singh, her brother's secretary, shook his head. Good morning, Your Highness. Something told me you'd be sneaking out to try and write Pasha, he said, with a smile that didn't reach his eyes. I wouldn't be so foolish, Mr. Singh. 
that brute of a horse won't let me anywhere near him. I tried feeding him an apple and he almost bit my hand off, she said ruefully. Ratan Singh laughed and Padmaja's heart skipped a beat. That's what she would miss the most about him, that laugh. It was all the more precious for being so rare. Ratan was a serious man. It took a lot to even make him smile. And it seemed like Padmaja was the only person who could make him laugh. Never in public, of course. He was very aware of his position as the Maharaja's secretary and kept a respectful distance from all the members of the royal family, much to Padmaja's disappointment. The only thing he couldn't seem to deny her were these morning rides. Padmaja knew this was their last ride together and she wanted to savor every minute of it. They were almost at the stable doors when a stable hand came running out. He froze when he saw them standing outside. What's going on? The groom bowed to Padmaja. Khamma Khani, Your Highness. Ratan Babu, please take the princess back to the Zanana. There's been a terrible tragedy. We need to inform the Maharaja. What happened? Pasha is missing, said the groom mournfully. Is that all? He must have kicked his stall open. Where's Bura? He will know where to find that silly horse, said Padmaja with a laugh. That's the problem, Your Highness. Bura is dead. What? How? The groom looked from her to Ratan Singh uncomfortably. Padmaja pushed past him and entered the stable. Princess, stop! You can't go in there! Padmaja ignored Ratan's shout and made straight for Pasha's stall. It was empty. The stall next to it was open and Bhura was lying on his back looking peaceful. It was as if he had died in his sleep. Only the big red bow around his neck told a different story. Thank you. I hope you liked it. Part 1. Parada The soft drizzle was turning into a heavy shower. I rolled up the windows of the car as I drove home. I love this rain. It brings this perpetually bustling city to a standstill. And when it does stop, don't even get me started on that. Every leaf is spotlessly green, every breath one takes is laced with its smell and God forbid if one makes the mistake of sipping a steaming cup of tea. They're hooked for life, yes, bless the milky, sugary Indian chai, one that puts the Chinese oolong to shame. Rain makes me nostalgic. It reminds me of Manav, his childlike excitement the delirium that I knew in those days, and my lucky stars for bringing us together. After our first few meetings, I was finding it increasingly difficult to admit to myself that I was smitten. Being in love with him made me feel the way I did as a 10 year old, waking up on the morning of the first day of summer vacation, excited of all the good times that lay ahead. All this happened in the last few months. I think it was Mario Andretti who said, if everything seems under control, you're just not going fast enough. I changed the music and smiled sheepishly at the road as if it shared my happiness. I hummed along with Led Zeppelin. I wondered if the way I felt while driving was synonymous to being with Manav. Carte blanche, yes, that was the word. Blank paper in French the freedom and autonomy to do as one wishes. I parked the car and took the flight of stairs instead of the elevator, seemingly sure of the beat of spring in my step. As I unlocked the door, the door plate stared back at me, Gaurav and Bharata Menon. I could conveniently unsee and disregard not only the door plate, but also my marriage from my peripheral vision these days. Part 2 Gora. The soft drizzle was turning into a full blown torrential downpour. I shut the window of my kitchen to stop the rainwater from seasoning my curry with a rusty aftertaste. I detest this rain. It brings the entire city to a standstill, and when it does stop, don't even get me started on that. There are puddles everywhere, one has to watch every step and God forbid if one does make the unfortunate mistake of trotting around in a flip-flop, then the liquefied garbage of the street is on one's feet. 
Rain makes me claustrophobic. Not just one spirits, but it dampens the interiors of the house as well. Unlike the popular nursery rhyme, the incessant pitter-patter is a constant reminder of things that are beyond one's control. How little one can do and how minuscule one's existence is. I heard Varada unlocking the door. We avoid facing each other as much as we can and at the cost of sounding like a snappy wisecrack, we earnestly do put a sincere effort into it. There is no cliched hug or show of interest of the other's presence. Display of affection was for the adolescents, that icky, nascent and effervescent kind of puppy love. We were wild, detached and too, for, too old for that now. Varda walked into the kitchen, took a bottle of water from the refrigerator and come, came up to the stove and pried over the curry. I turned the heat down so that the raging prawn curry came down to a slow simmer and bubbled back at us appetizingly from the stove. The amount of restraint it took out of me to not empty the pan's boiling content over her head, the red hot curry running down her impeccable hair, youthfully flawless, unblemished skin and her whiter than white linen sari. Of the mindless amount of screen time I was privy to, the scene that stayed with me today was the one where the antagonist's blonde head was crowned to death with hot molten metal. But I didn't want to stop there. I wanted to smack my antagonist's face with the pan afterwards while it was still hot. Oh no, the curry was too dear to me. I had immaculately sliced pink, excruciatingly tearful, drink it like shallots into scrawny julians, then peeled and pounded some pearl white garlic along with an inch of gnarly ginger. The trio then had a threesome of their own in smoking coconut oil, spoonfuls, mostly lesser, of russet spices acted like olfactory pheromones along with a sprinkling of salt and sugar. They were then joined by chopped red tomatoes that deposed the whole pan and amalgamated all the ingredients into one caramelized mush. Lustrous and glassy prawn met them to eventually turn cryptically opaque. I poured some freshly squeezed, let me reiterate, not canned, but freshly squeezed coconut milk into the pan. The red hot curry immediately mellowed down into submission and turned amber. I wonder why I never think of Varada the way I do of my culinary spread. My kitchen excited me more than a boudoir. I pictured myself as Tolkien's or Peter Jackson's golem. I leave that choice to you, addressing the ring as precious. In this case, my scrumptious amber red prawn curry and snickered. Coming down to plating my labor of the day, I took her favorite blue ceramic ball I had gifted her on a trip to Istanbul. Brushing aside the faint reminder of us and the trip, I served a portion of the fragrant long grain basmati rice into one half of the bowl and the prawn curry into the other half. Now all that remained was to garnish it. But before that, I cleared my throat and spit out a concoction of saliva and phlegm from the farthest possible end of my esophagus into her blue bowl. For a change, I squeezed out a little water from the dishwashing sponge for added flavor. As per a popular television commercial, a dishwashing sponge had more germs than a toilet handle, all for the uninterrupted screen time. What better? Stirred it, topped it with some chopped coriander leaves and called out, dinner's ready.